This is a video about the Lorewolf beta. I've previously mentioned that I don't have the time to make this video, yet we are watching this video at this moment. How did that happen? The Lorewolf team reached out to me and they offered to sponsor this video. In exchange for their sponsorship, they are getting a video that provides feedback, commentary, criticism, accolades, and access to my audience to raise awareness of their project. I'm not sweetening my review. I'm not catering to them. I'm simply providing the same service that I would have if I was not in a time crunch. So I would like to say thank you to the Lower Wolf team for making it possible for me to make this video and for being my first sponsor and for being a sponsor that is actually relevant to the content that I make on this channel. So let's get into the Lore Wolf beta. Sort of the elephant in the room, if you're keen to these sort of changes, is that the logo shifted, they sweetened it, they took out some of the extra emblems and symbols and simplified it down to the howling wolf in front of the moon in just the simple type that says Lore Wolf. I think this is really crisp, and I really liked this change when I saw it. I thought it was a good move. And I'm not one for optimizing logos or changing branding just for the sake of it. So I really appreciate this and I actually really like the style of this logo a lot. A basic overview of this beta is that the user is provided the opportunity to create two progenitors that they can then breed and create little pups. The progenitors that you create can be several different types of breeds. The general theme is that on Lore Wolf you have canids or to simplify wolves but there's several different types of breeds. There's the Lupin, the Jockal, the Kit, the Brockus, and the Zerda. For your progenitor, you can either make a Jockal, a Lupin, or a Kit. And if you wanna go through the progenitor creation process, they do have this live as their demo on the Lore Wolf website, even if you don't have beta access. And you're able to breed those different types together. In the breeding mini game, there are several attributes such as color, and markings that pass down from the parents. It's kind of similar to Flight Rising in the sense that the colors are within a color wheel and the offspring is gonna have a color between the parents' colors and the markings, I believe, have different likelihoods of passing on depending on their rarity. I'm not exactly familiar with all of that yet as the game is new and I am new to it. I'm just gonna rapid fire through these features so that you have a landscape view of the game, but I'm going to go into detail in many of these because they're worth it. There are so many mini games on Lore Wolf. You have the exploring and the questing, which is player versus environment. And then there are different crafting games. And then there are the player versus player games that are populated with bots to help during this beta time. And they're really interesting. I've had a really good time playing them. And then they have a companion mini game where you bond with the companions. It's a very full bodied game experience. There is no shortage of activities to do, but at the same time, it doesn't feel overwhelming if you don't get to all of them. And that could just be because it's early on and I haven't seen how all the features build on one another yet, but in my experience, I'm not feeling that pressure to be on every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour. I find myself comfortable logging on once or twice a day and not feeling the pull to be on for an hour at a time. On the other hand, you can stay on the site and play continuously over a span of many hours because there are enough passive energy features to counterset the stamina draining features that have a hard cooldown. So there's a mix of gameplay elements that give you the opportunity to keep playing even when you can't play everything. It's no secret that I started this YouTube channel as a way to get access to betas to games. And it was a very successful ploy in the sense that I have had alpha and beta access to mini games that have launched and some games that haven't launched. And the thing that really strikes me as being most notable about this beta is how functional it is. If we think back to Flight Rising's early days, the game was not playable. It did not have the server fortitude that Lore Wolf seems to have. Now at the same time, I'm not sure how many users are online at any one given time. They don't have a counter on the website. You can't see how many concurrent users there are. So it could be that there are just so few users boggling the system that it can 
handle it all. So I don't know what the scale looks like, but from a functionality perspective, if the feature is present, you are able to interact with it and get a coherent outcome. I'm pleasantly surprised by how functional this game is. It's so common that a game will enter beta with really limited functionality. And this is a game that, as far as I can tell, could launch tomorrow. That glowing review aside, there are fingerprints of its betaness all over it. While it could launch tomorrow, and I do believe it would have a retention value, it would be able to entertain and entice users into staying and coming back, there would be plenty of outcry of why did you launch this? It's not ready yet. So to that point, we will be discussing the things that do desire some sweetening, some optimizing, and just in general tightening around the game. When we look at some of the basic aspects of the Kickstarter game, it's clear that this game has been in development for a long time, right? When they launched the Kickstarter, they said we already had a successful alpha, and the beta is the last step before the official launch. So it makes sense that it's in its semi-completed state right now, and the beta seems to be a marketing technique to raise awareness. One really fascinating thing about the Kickstarter was that the goal is $3,000, and they blew right by that with $46,000 raised for this project. Some of the features that I don't see as being fully fleshed out make sense when you compare it against the Kickstarter. We're gonna go over it, but the fishing mini game was a stretch goal and that one I see as having many issues. And then when we're gonna talk about hunting or farming, that's not even accessible yet. So it makes sense considering that they were tacked on after the alpha as a result of the Kickstarter. The game actually looks a lot like it did in the Kickstarter promo video. Whenever I see a mock-up of a game being played on Kickstarter, I'm always like a little skeptical and worried that they just have images or slides put together and animated in such a way that it looks like a functioning website. And the fact that there is such consistency between what we saw in that Kickstarter video and what I'm actually playing today is very impressive. Let's start with the campaign feature. So Lorewolf's campaign feature reminds me a lot of Leiden's Explore and Flight Rising's Coliseum. It's kind of like both of those together. When you go to the campaign page, you build up a party and that party consists either of your wolves or of some of your wolves and some of their companions if their companions are a high enough level. The wolves have to have at least five stamina to go explore and each time they explore it will take some of the stamina. So you have to build up enough stamina to go and then you have to regenerate stamina throughout the exploration feature. I have a couple of nitpicks about the design of the party UI, but let's just talk about Explore for a second. This is the mechanism in which the beta quests have been given out, so I imagine that moving forward through events, all of the questing, the RPG storyline is going to be through the campaign or Explore feature. How it's worked is there are NPCs and they give you quests, and the quests are either to kill mobs or pick up items, or kill mobs, and by killing them, loot items. I enjoyed the beta, they, the quests worked. So now that I've mentioned the overview, the functionality of the explore feature, let's talk about some of the quirks, pet peeves, and then just some of the recommendations that I've seen on the forums, or where to optimize this feature. It, it doesn't necessarily prompt you to fill up your party in the first place, so for the first day I was only sending my alpha Lacey out to do activities and she was getting her butt kicked. And then I eventually learned that I could staff up the party with her homies and now she's holding her ground. They're all getting experience and it's a beautiful thing. This nitpick originated on the campaign page for me but then once I started going through the website I see it emerge in different places, and in some places, my concern is addressed. So a standardization of addressing this issue would rectify the issue. Let's talk about what's going on. So we've got the campaign map, we've got the party members. In the party member column, there are different cards representing the different party members. So you have your wolf, and then you have their stats, 
what their synergies are, and then what their experience and stamina are. Stamina is important because you burn stamina when you explore. It takes five stamina to explore every time you explore. You need your wolf to have some stamina in order to go explore. The problem is, if you're not familiar with the UI, it's your first time, you're new to the game, you're not gonna be able to tell which of the bars is stamina and which one is experience. You won't even know that that's what those are because they're not labeled. You'll be able to tell that there's a proportion in the bar, but you won't be able to tell what the proportion is because there's no numeric value. So you're not labeled with what the variable is or what the value of the variable is. So for instance, I've got Lacey here and there are two bars. One is entirely gray and one is mostly red. If we're just doing wayfinding and we're looking at this page and we're trying to figure out using context clues in its own column. So if we just go up in the party members column, it says required stamina five and that is a gold bar. There are no gold bars next to my wolves names. There are no gold bars. So it's just a little confusing because if you're trying to figure it out in the moment, you're gonna look for something that's the same color as the signal that's telling you how much is needed for stamina and there's none. Where this is solved is on the den. When you go to your individual wolves pages, They've got the same bars. However, when you hover, they give you the values. They don't give you the variables, but they do give you the values. You could see it when you're just hovering in the den page. So you're able to kind of figure out, okay, this red one, that's stamina. And if there's a purple one, that's experience. But it would just be so nice if it was labeled. It wouldn't take all that much space to scooch over the bar and just put EXP next to experience, and then below that, next to the red, put STM. And if it's on the den page, then how come it cannot be on the party member page? If you hover, it says view details, but you don't actually get the option to view any details. It's just not that intuitive. It's, it's a major quirk for me, a head scratcher, and it's not that hard to fix. I mean, it's not exactly a game breaker, but we're gonna talk about something similar on some of the other pages. This is like another pet peeve, but the quest log, it's not like a situation where you could click on it and then it expands. You hover over it, which means that you cannot copy the text that shows up in the box. I would, this is a personal thing, I would much prefer it if I could click on it and then it would expand to show that text. So five out of five monster pods. I'm gonna turn this in, rustle up some scrub. I'm not a big text reader. I'm not, I know that lots of people feel differently about this. Since I'm not a big text reader, I would really appreciate it if it had the opportunity to like skip through text and then gave you a summary of simply what you need to take away or what you need to do but I know that that's a stylistic choice and that's up to the developers if they want to accommodate that because some want to encourage the immersion into the game. So what's going on here? So I'm doing explore. You just go to the explore page. You select the region, the mini area. You select that. You have the opportunity to either engage or ignore. I'm going to attack. I've got several guys in my group. I feel confident. Uh, I've got all my guys here. I'm gonna attack. The mechanism for battle doesn't require that the user choose which attacks and which order or anything of that sort. It more so takes into consideration the synergies of the different animals and uses the attacks available to them automatically to generate the battle and quickly skip to the outcome of the battle. And this is the primary way that you progress through the quests that were available in the beta quest line. Through these battles, you can get drops from the enemies. You can complete farming a certain amount of enemies. Also through exploring, you can interact with wolves that are just kind of loose and invite them to join your pack. You can also find forage vegetables or fruits like berries 
or come across bunnies and get them as meat. So I like this mechanism where you're not choosing individual attacks when you are in battle with a PvE, player versus environment, mob, and instead you are skipping through the battle and getting directly to the outcome. As a person whose little brain cannot handle reading through text and watching an animation that she has no control over, I would love the option to just skip the animation altogether and jump to the outcome, but that, like I said, that's a stylistic choice and I understand not offering it. So that's the explore or campaign feature. As you can see in like the world map, there are the different regions for the different alliances. I'm in the Gold Sea Alliance because I love wheat. Uh, no, I just, I, I liked the moon on the thing, so that's why I picked it. And during the beta campaign, there's only a couple of quests, so that's why there's only a couple of regions. But in the future, I can imagine you will work through the different areas on a quest line, and it's fun. I like the way it's set up. It takes into consideration many popular components from other games, right? It's like the Colosseum by Flight Rising, it's like Explore from Lyodin, it's all those things together and you get to level up your party members while doing it. Now, if you wanna to jump to something else, it's going to be accessible probably under this play area. And we've got the campaign, the gauntlet, the arena, professions, and pageants. And so let's move on. The next one would be the gauntlet. This is the gauntlet and it is a player versus environment game where you take your party and you enter them into battle with the mobs of one level. Let me show you, it'll be easier to show you. So in the first level, all of the mobs are gonna be level one. In the second level, they'll all be level two and so on and so forth. Basically, my pack is around level six, so I don't see us going past that in the mob level. Um, it does the auto battle feature for you, so all you have to really do is weigh the costs and benefits of giving your guys enough food to keep going because that red bar is the stamina. I believe the green is health i'm not i'm not quite sure to tell you the truth but you have to weigh the costs and balances of do i want to keep giving them stuff in order to continue this gauntlet you do get a lot of rewards though so that's pretty nice i'm just going to do a couple more levels all right that's enough for us next up is the arena and at first I had no idea what was going on. There is like a tutorial overlay in the little box that pops up, but it's really hard to understand from reading it. It's more so something that I think would benefit from like a small video demo or something that walks players through it. Uh, it's not intuitive and I struggled through it a lot. But after I got the hang of it, it quickly became probably my favorite feature on the site, even though it is super time consuming. Let's go through the basic mechanics of the arena game. Like I mentioned before, there is a tutorial. The tutorial refers to the different pieces, characters as pieces. Well, if I were designing this, I would call them cards. It reminds me of like a deck building game where you're drawing cards from a shuffled deck and trying to build cards and you discard the ones that you don't want and you pick up the ones that you want and you stack them and you play them. This page layout is really long, so I'm gonna be doing some quirky things in order to make it work in this video format. At the beginning of the game, you're going to select a piece from the pile provided. That will become your active piece and it will go into battle. At the end of each battle round, you've either been defeated or you're victorious and you can pick either another piece from the pool, or you can refresh and get a new shuffled stack to choose from. You're choosing pieces based off of the deck you wanna build. There are different synergies, which are the different colored icons for each piece. This is why I would call it a card, because cards have different attributes, but I guess piece works as well. To the left of your team, underneath where it says the round metrics, you can see the chart that diagrams your synergy. 
and the synergies level up. There are different markers at which they unlock new attributes for your team that will go into effect either to just one synergy type or across the entire team. The goal is to power up your pieces by combining them. Taking this straight from the arena tutorial, once you have three one-star teammates of the same type, they will automatically combine into a two-star. Three two-star pieces combine into a three-star. A little hard to follow, but you're stacking your pieces that are alike. So if you've got a bunch of these white fox guys, then they're going to stack and become a two-star. And then once you have enough two stars, they stack and become a three star. And the three star is the ultimate level that you can reach. You can have up to five members on your team and you unlock those spots on your team according to what level you are, which corresponds to how much you're winning and losing as you go through the game. This is a really fun game. I find it very engaging. It's hard to resist playing. And when you run out of stamina from exploring or mining or whatever it is you're doing, you can always go play the arena. It's in a very compelling game. I enjoy it. However, there are some nitpicks. There are a lot of really good user suggestions that I've read and I don't necessarily want to duplicate them or claim them for my own. But some of the drawbacks of the games include that at this point in the beta, particularly, you're mostly playing against bots and you can get so far in a game and lose and then you still have to sit through like 10 minutes, it feels like 10 minutes, of just watching bots play because if you leave the game, then you forfeit your prize. And that's just kind of annoying because now you're being held captive to watch bots play a game that they don't fully understand because they're bots. Some of my favorite suggestions that I've read are implementing different models of gameplay. So you could have fewer rounds in a game session, which I think would be interesting. The big quality of life adjustment for me would simply being kicked from the game as soon as you lose instead of having to sit through and watch and spectate the rest of the game go on because if you are able to leave the game then you can start another one and make it just so if you lose early enough in the rounds that you get no prize or very low prize. It's always going to be more exciting to win the arena and definitely preserve that but don't make it so punishing if you lose. So now we've talked about the campaign explore the gauntlet and the arena which are kind of like the main courses of the gameplay what else is there well we've got the crafting which comes in various different forms we've got mining cooking she's upset that there isn't a border collie breed on lore wolf but that's fine i told her that she's got to get over it because the world does not revolve around a beautiful puppy we have cooking crafting mining, and fishing. But fishing is kind of the odd man out here where it's not so much collecting and transforming, it's more so just collecting. So we're gonna talk about fishing first and then we're gonna get into those other mini games that are about transformation, whereas fishing is just its own thing. So let's get into that first. Earlier I mentioned that fishing was a Kickstarter stretch goal in that I see some quirks with it that I don't really think it's ironed out. And some of you who've been playing the beta are probably like, that's an exaggeration. I'm more so referencing this in context to other games and there's just a class-wide issue with getting fishing right. It's hard to make fishing a compelling and exciting game because the act of fishing in real life is not an exciting and compelling game. So when you build it as part of your virtual game, the challenge is to make it fun. I think that Lorewolf has approached it in an interesting way where they give you a time limit. What doesn't make sense to me is that you have to use 25 stamina in order to fish. Isn't fishing kind of a restorative activity? In my experience with other games, you can fish to regain health, right? So instead of spending stamina on fishing, you would gain stamina by fishing. 
it's not a super fun game. You're just clicking at ripples. And, you know, there are different ways to expand on this, right? Maybe have some kind of system that you could set up to fish for you um, or make some ripples more challenging or some fish more challenging. And definitely this is the sort of thing where there will be more areas in the future and uh, by adding variety it'll become more engaging. But, you know, it just it feels not very flushed out, which isn't surprising. Uh, to me, it's one of the least engaging parts of the game. The other professions, which are nested in a tab, are crafting, mining, cooking, farming, and hunting haven't been added yet, but I presume hunting may follow a similar mechanic structure to fishing, and then farming would be like a click and plant, cool down, and then you come back and harvest type of scenario, which I'm looking forward to. I like that. But one of the common one of the common pieces of feedback that I've heard about professions is that instead of them being nested under play, they should have their own tab altogether. What I really like about crafting, mining, and cooking is the way that the activities are counted and gamified, right? So not only is it its own mini game to go into mining and send your wolf to go mine which by the way to me this is the most mimetic image this very sad image of my wolf pushing a mining cart like to me like i have like a dog that i adore and so when i see this i'm just like oh sending baby down to the mines which is like <laughs> like it's so silly to me like i enjoy looking at this very much um this very silly image of a wolf pushing a mining cart like it's like oh I guess I don't care about the children or the puppies because they're going down to the mines. Not only is this game a game with activities, but at the top of the screen, as you see, we've got an activities counter on the left and then a crafting specific activity counter on the right. This is genius, and this is across all of the crafting games. So it, it actually extends into all of the actions that you could do on the site. If you complete five explores, then you're going to get 100 of the currency. If you cook four foods, you're going to get 500 currency. I love this. This is so much fun it really incentivizes playing the game. So I mentioned earlier that you don't have to do a lot on Lore Wolf to feel good about logging on, but you do have the ability to stay on if, all day if you please. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. These activity counters that reward you for playing the game, this is the way that it carries you through and incentivizes you to keep playing. But because your wolves don't die, they don't have a short lifespan, you don't feel like you're wasting time if you get on and do a rollover and you don't do anything of consequence. I love this. This is super cool. I didn't know this until yesterday, but each week on Lore Wolf, there is a different like caravan. And this week, it is the crafting caravan. So if I go to professions and I go to crafting, I do a little crafterino. It tallies that up here. And if I craft 100 times, I'm going to get five craft tickets that I can then take to this crafting caravan and buy crafting specific items. Last week, it was cooking. This week, it's crafting. Following that trend, I would say possibly mining or fishing would be next. But this is so exciting and so interesting because it incentivizes you focusing on one of the crafts for a week. I love this. It's really fun. It's very smart. It's very cool. With this, you can buy stuff specifically for crafting, which is what you're going to be focusing on. So in addition to the regular shops, you can buy that. And it's just very well thought out. The crafting mini games themselves are what you would expect. So you can learn recipes, you can buy recipes, and you take the item, you press the button and make another item. <laughs> or cooking, 
you click the thingy, you say cook it, and then it cook it. You know, like it's not incredibly challenging. There's a little bit of, I guess, a, the world's tiniest learning curve to figuring out like what order do I, do I press these buttons to mine and then smelt. But it's not that hard to figure out and I'm having a really good time. There are things I missed and did not cover. And for that, you know, I, I beg your forgiveness. Um, but this is the majority of the Lore Wolf experience. I've been playing a lot over the last week or so. So I want to say thank you to the Lore Wolf team for nudging me to play because I've been enjoying it a lot. And, you know, I've actually felt kind of guilty because I've been working on this video, but there are a lot of times that I haven't necessarily been working on the video and I've just been playing because <laughs> it's really easy to get on and just do the arena or just do a gauntlet or just craft some items passively. And it's a very rewarding game to just kind of check in on. So it's become kind of like my primary play for the last couple of days. Trying not to get too bonded to my wolves because after the bait is over, they will be no mo. But, you know, I'm having a great time. I'm really enjoying it. And the Lore Wolf team was generous enough to provide me with five beta keys to give out to you guys. So how we're gonna do this is I have a Twitter account. That Twitter account is at Bonkish. And starting today, the day this video is published, I will be holding a daily giveaway where I'm gonna be asking of something. The first one's gonna be a, a picture of a pet. Does not necessarily have to be your pet, but you know, cause I wanna be fair. Uh, but frankly, I just wanna see a picture of your pets and I will be randomly selecting one person to give a lore wolf beta test key to and then every day for the next four days so stay tuned for that i will try to be fair with the time periods the time ranges that i pick from so it's not just everybody from one time zone getting a key and i hope you enjoyed this video let me know what you think in the comments a funny off-topic thing that I wanted to mention is when Dapper Volk opened, Flight Rising saw some issues because a whole bunch of people on Flight Rising started trading things for Dapper Volk things, and they did not want that to happen with Lorewolf because there were a lot of issues when that happened with Dapper Volk. So I thought it was kind of funny that the early access for Lorewolf started on March 24th and the regular access started on March 26th. And on March 25th, Flight Rising released an update that reminded users that cross-site trades for games in alpha or beta or for codes unrelated to Flight Rising are not allowed. I just, I thought that was kind of funny. Somebody pointed that out and I was like, oh, <laughs> Flight Rising has had enough of this. <laughs> it's like, okay, they see you as competition, Lore Wolf. Um, I thought that was kind of funny to see. It makes a lot of sense. There was a lot of drama when the Flight Rising users were trying to get Dapper Volk stuff. And I was kicking myself like, oh, should have traded my Dapper Volk stuff for light sprites or bone fiends or whatever. But I've been playing more Lore Wolf the past couple of days than Flight Rising. And I think that you guys are going to like it a lot.